Welcome to Sleepless Ronin Plays. Today we're going to learn how to play Battletech, the traditional classic game of armored combat. We're going to be playing with the new stuff that came with the uh, Clan Invasion Kickstarter, including some of the wonderful maps of Tukayid. We're going to be playing with a very small force today because this really just is an introductory video. We're not trying to do anything complex or heavy. We're just going to learn the basic, very simple rules. With that being said, the clans are going to be represented by a Grindle, one lone medium Omnimech, and the Inner Sphere is going to be represented by a Phoenix Hawk and a Wasp. And despite the fact that they're two to one numbers, the clanners have a significant advantage in this. Because their weaponry is just better, their better, their mechs are just overall better. Even if we go off the battle value for the mechs, which I'll show you the record sheets for. We have the Grindle. He has a battle value of 2290. That's actually not his real battle value, because it'd be slightly better with a piloting skill with a gunnery of three and a piloting skill of four. Average for clan Omnimech pilots. The inner sphere pilots are both four fives. Also, again, average for inner sphere pilots. You'll notice their battle value is 1359 and 423. If we're playing a competitive game, I am definitely undermatched. Even with a 2 to 1 ratio, there's a little bit of math in there as well. It's still not exactly a fair fight. But this is not about being a fair fight. This is about simply teaching the mechanics of the game today. With that being said, if you have access to your own Kickstarter or have bought the uh, Battletech uh, introductory box, you should have one of these. This is a wonderful heavy-duty, durable cardstock table. And it has all kinds of tables. Piloting skill, movement costs, punch locations, cluster hits, kick locations, different levels, uh, reactions for physical attacks. Your attack modifier table, attack modifier table for physical attacks. Your hit locations, including left side, center torso, right side. So, depending on the angle you're coming in your attack from. Heat point table. All these things are right here. It's really, really nice. It's really awesome. It's something that comes in both of these, the starter of the box sets, the Invasion and the uh, Intro box, and it is supremely useful. Having one of these at the table whenever you're playing a game is amazing. We've also got our dice. You'll need multiple sets of dice. One set is usable. Multiple sets is preferred because I'll show you a trick later on about rolling multiple sets at the same time in order to make your dice rolls faster. Beyond that, we've also got wet erase markers. I prefer the Statler ones. They're not dry erase, so you can't rub them off during the play, so they're wet erase. And if you'll notice when I showed the record sheets earlier, I had them in a plastic cover. This means that once you print off one record sheet, or copy one record sheet, you no longer have to worry about destroying it. Just keep it in a file folder somewhere, and you can reuse them just by slipping them in these Easily available lam uh, laminated sheet things available at any office supply store. That's one of our pretty simple mechanics we'll be dealing with. Then one of the other important things are our movement markers. I'm going to show off a couple types of these to the, to the game today when I'm as I'm demonstrating it. But honestly, I have two different kinds. I've got a kind that my gaming group and I have used for years, which are pretty visible on the table. They tell you what your mech has done in the words. Have you walked, ran, or jumped? And it tells you the modifier your opponent needs to hit you. That's really nice and simple. They're very, they show up really well. But I recently decided I wanted something different. So I bought these awesome dice from a Mr. Laser shop on Etsy. I'm not sponsored at all by this fellow. They are instead these dice. So there's two varieties of dice. The kind with the arrows. One arrow means it's walk. An arrow that's in the two lines means it's a run. And the arrow with the three behind it is a jump. Or you can just, you know, white, walk, black, run, red, jump. Or he makes the ones that have the words walk, run, and jump. I really like those. I find them to be really nice because you can just sort of Roll them around and go, oh, okay, it's, a, it's that speed. Or that speed. 
So it's really nice. They're very flexible, very usable. I have a whole bunch of, I got a whole bunch of those. I got, I got multiple sets just because I sometimes uh, game master games and it's really nice to have a lot of those available. If you're enjoying these videos I'm making, please hit like and subscribe. It helped me out a whole lot. With all that introductory material said, now it's time to jump into actually playing the game, or how to play Battletech itself. We have some mechs set up on the battlefield, as we discussed, the Grendel and his two Intersphere opponents. I'm doing a really quick setup. I want them to engage extremely fast, brutal, and have this really done. I want to only demonstrate like two or three rounds tops, but I'm hoping to show almost everything I can in the game. So we're going to begin with an initiative roll. Every turn begins with an initiative roll. One player from each team will take a pair of dice and will roll off. So we have the Smoke Jag dice for the Clanner, and we're going to use the Rassle Head dice for the Inner Max. We're going to roll off. Seven for the Inner Sphere and six for the Clans. This means the Inner Sphere wins. Whichever team wins, the other side does everything first. They move first, declare weapons first, shoot first, make physical attacks first, and so on and so on. They're at a bit of a disadvantage because going first does not always does not really give an advantage. You can't react to what your opponent's doing. The cleaner is going to go first. Because he's going first, he's going to take a more cautious uh, start. He's a 7-11-7 mech, which means he has 7 movement points when he walks, 11 when he runs, and 7 when he jumps. He's going to begin by jumping because it's the easy way for him to get in the battlefield off the plateau he's starting on. He also thinks he's going to grab some force for protection. One, two, three, four, five. That's a good enough jump. Don't want to overheat too much. So he's going to jump to there. I'm going to grab those dice I displayed earlier. I'm going to find the red one that's the jump dice. I'm going to place it next to the mech. It shows I moved five to six hexes, five hexes in this case, and it shows my modifiers. Now, the industry will begin moving. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So that's the Phoenix Arc. The Phoenix Arc is going to run one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So he's in some woods. He's getting a little bit of protection out there also. You know, he did a full, he did a run as fast as he can go. He ran his whopping nine hexes. He actually didn't run nine hexes. He ran seven hexes using all nine movement points because it takes a point to turn and a point to enter light woods. Still, a 7 to 9 is the same modifier. The Wasp is going to be a bit more cautious. Oh, maybe not. That's, meh. See, it's really scary for the Wasp. The Wasp knows if he takes a single hit, he's toast. But in hope, in all hope, maybe the clan is going to play by a bit of Zellbringen. And he will actually end up attacking the Phoenix Hawk mainly. And leave the poor, and leave the poor little Wasp alone. So the Wasp, the Wasp definitely doesn't want to go slow at all. He knows it's a bad thing to go slow. He's going to jump to there. Again, scary range, but he did a jump. A jump of five hexes, because he went one, two, three, four, five, into some white woods. So at least he's going to get a good defense modifier. That's what he's looking for. So now it's time for the clanner. The clan mech knows that this target is five hexes away, and that target is six hexes away. That's silly sad for the Wasp, because the Wasp is in really good range. But I'm going to pretend we're playing by Zelbringen. I'm going to go for the Phoenix Hawk instead. It's six hexes away. So he's going to declare his weapons over there. He knows a six hex range, which puts all of his weapons at medium range, except for his ER small, which he's not going to bother with. And of course the ER large is at short range. He's going to probably, he's definitely going to fire the ER large. He's going to fire the Streak sixes, because if they don't work, they don't work. And there's no penalty for firing streaks if they miss. You don't waste any heat, you don't waste any ammo. He's going to fire one ER medium, one streak six, and one ER large. Pretty simple starting volley. That's his declaration. Then the industry mechs have to make their declaration. The Wasp knows he's only got one weapon in range, so he's going to fire his medium pulse laser. Since he only jumped five hexes, and the medium pulse laser is only a heat four, he's not actually overheating any of this turn. He's also looking to manage his heat. The Phoenix Hawk is at six hex range. Barely in range for the inner sphere medium pulse lasers. So he's going to fire both of those. And he's going to throw in one ER large laser. Because he won't overheat that way. And it gives him an extra weapon. Because he ran. So that's how he's going to fire. 
one year large, two medium pulses. So now the cleaner gets to fire first. He looks at his target and he goes, okay, so we're gonna do this by the gator method. It's the new method that they've developed using these sheets. The gator acronym is, is referenced all over these sheets, which is really nice. So first we have G, gunnery. Our clanner, as we know, is a better gunner than the industry pilots. So he's a three. So a gunnery of three. He jumped. That's his that's his attack, that's his A. That's his attacker movement on fire. A. He jumped, so he's another three. So he's a six. The target movement modifier is three, so we're at nine. Then we look and we look at the uh, center to center hex. We see that it passes through this woods and this woods. That's good for the Phoenix Hawk. That means there's another plus two to hit. So we go from a nine to an 11. Okay. This means the Phoenix Hawk is needing, needs to be hit with 11s using all the weapons on the, on the Grindle if they're at short range. Unfortunately, they're not. The ER medium and the Streak 6 are at medium range, which means that neither one of them can hit. The Streak weapon just doesn't fire. Nothing happens. The ER medium is wasted, and it generates heat. But the Grendel's not too worried about the heat, because since the Streak didn't hit, the heat's not going to be a big issue. That leaves him with a single ER large laser needing 11s to hit. So he rolls. Ooh, he misses badly. Then we go to the Wasp. The Wasp has a gunnery of four. He jumped, so he goes to a seven. The Grindle has a defensive three, ten. There's a forest, eleven. Long range is another plus four, so we're going to fifteen. And minus two for pulse lasers, a thirteen. The poor, poor, poor Wasp doesn't hit because his weapon can't strike. Then there's the Phoenix Hawk. The Phoenix Hawk is a gunnery of four. He only ran six. The target jumped nine. There's one forest in the way between them and one forest he's in. So we're looking at 11s. 11s plus the long range of the medium pulse lasers, once again, means they can't hit. But it's short range for the ER large laser, meaning he needs 11s. So he's going to try and make that roll. He also misses. This is a very short first turn. No one got damaged. No one's hit by anything. So now we're going to just you know, deal with the heat. The Phoenix Hawk generated 8 points of heat from his medium pulse lasers, 12 points from the ER large, that's 20, and 2 from running, 22. He dissipates 24 with his 12 doubles. So he generates 0 heat. The Wasp also generates 0 heat. The Grendel generates 12 heat from his ER large, 5 heat from his ER medium, 17, and he jumped 5 hexes. 17 to 5 is 22. He has 24 heat, uh, 12 double heat sinks, Jerry, uh, dealing with 24. He also generates zero heat. This is going to come down to an issue game, I do believe. It's back to initiative. Clans are represented by smoke jag dice, and the industry is being represented by rassle Hag dice. Six and six, it's a reroll. Eight and seven, the clans have the win. The industry has to go first. The Phoenix Hawk likes where he's at, so he's gonna do something really dumb. I say really dumb, but it's just necessary to get this demonstration going. The Phoenix Hawk is going to do a stop. He's not moving at all. He's staying in his woods. He's hanging out right there. He's going to drop that heat, and he's just going to cool off. The wasp, however, is going to do a little bit of movement. They're going to try to do a pincer formation on this guy. The wasp goes, one, two, three, four, five, six. He has literally done a, he's moved three hexes, because it's not a jump, and so you can actually cross on the same hex. He's doing a very simple walk. And because I want to demonstrate things, the Grindle is also just going to pull a stop maneuver. It's not great. It's not smart. But again, 
This is demonstration purposes. We just want to show everything that can happen in the game. So the Inner Mechs have to declare their weapons. Once again, the Wasp Alpha Strikes the Grendel. No reason not to. In fact, when he Alpha Strikes the Grendel, he's going to use his Flamer to generate heat instead of damage because the Grendel's running hot, so he wants to pressure the Grendel. The Phoenix Hawk is going to fire both medium pulses and one ear large again. This mech is just overheat problem. Pop you can generate so much heat in this Phoenix Hawk if you don't watch your weaponry. It's got two ER larges and two medium pulse lasers. That's just way too much heat. That is, that, that's 32 heat. And it can only handle 24. It's not even counting its movement, so it can just cook itself alive. The Grindle is already running hot. No shooting modifier, but he's already running hot. So the Grindle's just going to lay off the ER large. That's his biggest weapon to lay off of. He's going to fire everything else at the Phoenix Hawk, though. So that's three ER mediums, ER small, and streak six. Industrial Mexico first. The Wasp has a gunnery of four. It, it walked, so five. Target didn't move. In woods, six. He needs sixes to hit with his small weapons and fours with that medium pulse laser. See, this is what happens when you don't move. It's a very silly game. Movement is the key to life, if you're wondering about biotech. The better you can move, the less likely you're to be hit by weaponry. So that's why by stopping everybody, this can be a brutal, brutal round of damage. Sixes with the small weapons. The flamers with the red dice. And look at that. We missed with the flamer and one ear, one small laser. Anyways, so a small laser hits the Grendel. Then we have the medium pulse laser needing a four to hit because pulses rock and it hits. Okay. So now we have to roll for locations on the Grendel. The small laser, we are coming in. This is also important. We're behind the dashed line. You'll notice this dashed line right here. We're behind the center part of the mech which means we're firing into the Grindle's left side. If you ever wonder, just pretend you're the mech and go, that's my left hand, that's being shot on the left side. Okay, being shot on the left side. You'll find this on your cardboard uh, pay, uh, page again, in the hit locations table. You'll look at the left side, and you'll roll the dice. Small laser goes into the six on the left side, or the left leg. The medium pulse laser goes into the five on the left side, or the left arm. I'm not going to show you actually marking me actually marking the sheets. I'm going to display that in a graphic, which you're probably watching right now. And that is the wasp shooting. Next, the Phoenix Hawk fires. He's a gunnery of four. Target's a zero. ER large laser needs a four to hit. The medium pulses also, or no, sorry, there's woods. Need a five to hit, and medium range for the pulse lasers, which is essentially the equivalent of short range because the minus two, plus two minus two, it's a wash. And then the woods, so fives. He needs five for everything to hit. Medium pulses, both of them hit, and the ER large also hits. There we go. This time we're actually going to see some damage. This time we're actually have piloting skill checks all over the place at the end of this turn, which is good. So he's firing into the front instead of the left side, so weapon shots in the front. The two medium pulse lasers, center torso and left torso. Six, or Sorry, right torso, left torso. Six is right, eight is left. And the ER large laser into the 11. And the 11 is the left arm. That's actually good. We've already done some damage to the left arm. We're going to have a critical hit roll in a second. Two damage internal means we get to roll on the critical hit chart. The critical hit chart can be found just below the hit location chart on your on your cardboard uh, value charts. Nine! Nine is a critical hit. Usually, you need to roll two dice to determine critical hits. First dice determines upper, lower. In the case of the Grindle, though, in the left arm, there is no lower, so we don't have to roll the first die. We just roll the second die to determine the exact weapon or exact critical hit slot that's been hit. We roll the three. The three corresponds to the lower arm actuator, so we put a strike through it. In future phases of shooting, not this one, in future phases of shooting, 
any weapons in that arm would have a plus one to hit. This can be found in the attack modifiers table on that cardboard piece of paper under the O category, the other category. So we've actually done some significant damage to the Grendel. He'll be having a piloting che uh, check because he took a whopping total of 26 damage this turn. Three medium lasers. Oh, no, nope. He had a small laser also. I forgot about that. He took 29 damage. Now let's do is take 20 damage in a turn to make a piloting check. So at the end of the shooting phase, the Grindel will be making a piloting check. Now we go to the Grindel shooting at the Phoenix Hawk. Like I said, he's firing everything except for the ER large laser. Everything's at short range. He's a gunnery of three. The Phoenix Hawk is in the woods, so fours. He needs fours for everything. Fours for the three ER medium lasers. They all hit. The four for the streak six. It hits barely. Oh, and we forgot the ER small laser. The ER small laser requires sixes to hit because it's at medium range. And it misses. Oh, the ER small fails us. Or fails the Grendel pilot, I guess we should say. So now we need to roll for hit locations with the ER medium lasers first because they're all the same weapon. So we have three ER medium lasers hitting the Phoenix Hawk. So we take three sets of dice and we roll them. We just pair them up. And we hit seven, eight, and nine. So we hit the center torso, the left torso, and the left leg, each for seven damage apiece. Then we grab six sets of dice because the clanner hit with a streak six. SRM weapons do two damage per missile, each missile hitting individually. Because it's a streak, all the missiles hit. Just flat out, all the missiles hit. Had this been a non-streak weapon, we'd find our missile chart, which is on the opposite side of the attack modifiers on the uh, cardboard sheet, and we're rolling 2d6 to determine how many missiles actually hit. But because it's a streak weapon, they just hit. That's six missiles individually hitting different locations. So we need six pairs of dice. Then we pair them all up. Let me take a, take a look at them. We have center torso, center torso, two center torso hits, left torso, left torso, left torso, and left leg. Wow, we really like three specific locations on this mech. So that's two damage per pair of dice. The Phoenix Hawk, while unlike the, the Grendel, hasn't have lost any armor in one location, is looking pretty, pretty beaten up. He's also definitely taken enough damage for a piloting check. In fact, he took 21 plus 12. He took 33 damage. Slightly more damage than the Grindel itself took. At the end of the shooting phase, we have a piloting check for the Grindel and the Phoenix Hawk. At the end of any phase, if a pilot has done an activity which would trigger a piloting check, they make it then. This includes jumping into water, running through rubble, jumping with broken actuators or hips or moving with a gyro out. There's a whole bunch of things that can cause a mech pilot to have to make a piloting check. And they do that at the end of any phase or in the situations that call for it. Sometimes when you turn on asphalt, you'll make a piloting check right then if you're running. Same thing when you jump. You land, when you land, you make the piloting check. When you run into rubble, you make the piloting check when you enter the rubble. So there's all kinds of situations when you make your piloting check. But when it comes to the combat phases, you make your piloting checks at the end of the combat phase. So, we have our piloting checks. So, the Grindel is a pilot of four, and he took 20 points of damage. He needs a five. That's all he's got to worry about right now. He passed it with an eight. He's good. The Phoenix Hawk is a pilot of five with 20 points of damage, so he needs to make it a six. He failed! Uh-oh. Problems for the Phoenix Hawk. He rolled a four. Now, the Phoenix Hawk is falling. There's nothing you can do about this. He first rolls one die to determine the direction he falls. He falls in the direction of two. My little trick is, right in front of you is one, behind you is a four. You go clockwise, so one, two, three, four, five, six. He falls to the two. He falls into the two, like so. 
Now that means he's fallen on his right side. You again, just pretend you're the mech, stand there and go, that's my right, that's my left. Done, done, done. So he fell on his right side. The first thing that happens is he takes damage. You take damage equal to one-tenth of your mech's weight, rounded up. Phoenix Hawks weigh 45 tons, that's 4.5 tons, that's 5 points of damage. The other way to think of it is, every 10 tons is 1 point of damage, rounded up. 5 points of damage. He rolls the location, because unfortunately he does this to himself. I fell on my right side. Right side 8 is center torso. So he takes 5 damage to the center torso. Then, he has to make a, another piloting check. Whenever a mechware falls, they always have to make an additional piloting seal check after they resolve their damage. That's called the seatbelt check. This is what, this is what the, people, the players kind of tend to refer to it as. Because they're, they're essentially the pilot in the mech is attempting to not suffer his own damage from the mech hitting the ground hard. So he makes another piloting skill roll in the Phoenix Hawk. This is exactly the same value as the one beforehand. So if I had to roll, I roll a six beforehand, I have to roll a six again to avoid taking pilot damage. Ooh, 12. I'm good and safe. If I had failed that and I'd taken a point of damage, I would then take a consciousness check. Because every time you take a pilot, team, pilot hit, you'd make a consciousness check. And failing your consciousness check means you're out cold, and that's not good. That's that's really bad. That's worse than a stop. That's an immobilized mech, and immobilized mechs are minus four to target. And boy, howdy, you don't want to be immobilized. Now, after the shooting phase is over, or the resolve weapons fire phase is over, that's the official title of it, I call it the shooting phase, we go into the physical attack phase. We're going to do this because... The Indosphere mechs are dirty, free-birth scum, and that little wasp is going to kick the Grindle, because it's funny. We we do our whole piloting thing again. It's a whole different kind of gator. This time, the we start with the piloting skill instead of the gunnery skill. We start with the piloting skill, because physical attacks are based on piloting skill. The wasp has a 5. He walked. It's a 6. The enemy mech is a 0, so 6. In the woods, it's a 7. And then there's the other thing. When you kick... It's a minus two. So he needs a five. The wasp needs a five to hit. And he really, 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 really wants to roll that five. Because if he doesn't roll that five, he has to make a piloting skill check. If he rolls that five, the Grindle has to make a piloting skill check. So there's lots of reasons to actually do physical attacks. Here we go. Wasp is rolling. Seven. The wasp boots the Grindle. Now, usually, if you're attacking from the front, directly in the front, or directly in the rear, you know, normal front and rear hexes, You'd make a little roll to see if you hit the right leg or the left leg. But because I am solidly in the Grindle's left side, I just kick him in the left leg. So I kick him in the left leg. Wasps weigh 20 tons, and kicks do 1 point of damage every 5 tons of mech waves. Which means my wasp will do 4 points of damage to the Grindle's left leg. I don't have to roll about any kind of rolls or anything like this. Except for, the course, the Grindle has to make a piloting roll now. Now this is a new phase... So the piloting roll is simply going to be the Grindle's 4. He has no other modifiers because he didn't move, and the kick didn't do enough damage to actually cause a piloting modifier. So the Grindle will make his piloting skill check. The Grindle passes his piloting skill check easily. And that's pretty much how the game of Battletech will go. Fire will be exchanged back and forth between mechs until mechs are rendered unable to fight any further. There are certain rules in scenario play and other things like that, which causes mechs to go on to what's called forced retreat. I'm not going to cover those rules here, because that's really something that's decided between the players and the game master, or between the players that are playing in battle. I think we've covered pretty much the most of the rules of Battletech. It's a relatively simple game. It's been around for a long time, and it still remains very fun. I'm happy to see new people picking it up, and I'm really happy with the Kickstarter that Catalyst recently did. It's an amazing Kickstarter, and I can't wait to get the second wave of the stuff in. All these things we played with today, aside from, of course, the dice I got from Etsy, were... From the Catalyst Kickstarter, you know, if you've enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. Uh, in the future, I may do a full playthrough of, ba of a Battletech scenario, though that might be pretty long, so I may not do that. Or, maybe I will teach a game of Alpha Strike. I do not know yet. Look forward to either one of those potentially in the future. Because Alpha Strike does play differently than basic Battletech. Alpha Strike is really designed for very large-scale combat between many mechs, entire battalions and novas, versus a star on lance, lance on lance kind of ordeal. Hope this is a, was good at teaching. If you did enjoy it, please hit like and subscribe. And that's it. This is Sleepless Ronin saying sayonara. 
and we'll catch you next time.